All right, go ahead, David. Good. And uh, let me just check. We're going to, we've got two hours altogether. You've muted yourself. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll aim not to talk for more than an hour, but maybe we can stop and pause as we go along. So we'll see how that goes. So, as I said, we're going to go through the the handout. Here's the plan of the talk. There'll be an introduction. I'll say a bit about Tyler Burge on naive realism. Then I'll talk a bit about representationalism. Then I'll talk about an idea associated with representationalism, the transparency of experience. I'll talk about causal impotence, the causal powers of uh, uh, sensory states on various theories, and then I'll wrap up. So thank you for the introduction, Daniel, and you listed my books, but uh, you didn't mention the most recent book, which is this book, uh, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience, which is just out with OUP, uh, I think about three, three weeks ago. And so that's Central Issues in Philosophy Perception, something I haven't worked on a lot before. And the ideas I'll, I'll be going through today are, are based on the analysis in the book, though in the book I don't specially uh, talk about how the different theories uh, uh, relate to work in, in uh, philosophy of perception, scientific theories of perception, scientific work on perception. And so I'm grateful of the opportunity to talk about that today. So, okay, let's get going and I'll keep my eye on the clock. So in the philosophy of perception, it's a central area in philosophy. It's a rather funny area. It's never quite clear what it's part of. Is it part of philosophy of mind? Is it part of epistemology? Is it part of metaphysics? It sometimes falls between the cracks, but everybody agrees it's a central area. It's, and in particular, the central question is what's the nature of conscious sensory perception? Everybody agrees is a central, central part of philosophy. What's, what's actually going on when uh, you see something or touch something or hear something? What's, uh, when you consciously have these experiences, how, we to, how, do, how do we to analyze what's going, going on? What are, what are the components of these, these states? What are they made of? David. And David, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, someone asked uh, in the chat uh, if you could just uh, make the text a little bit bigger. Uh, yeah. Does that work? That makes it bigger? Excellent. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. And if you look at a standard text on, on uh, the philosophy of perception, you will be told the two main theories, the two main competitors nowadays are naive realism and representationalism. Uh, you will sometimes get a mention of sense datum theories, uh, but uh, I won't say anything more about them today. They're pretty widely agreed to be inconsistent with, with physicalism and they're generally put to one side nowadays. Uh, part shater, if there are any uh, uh, sense datum theorists, I don't think Howard Robinson is here. There are a few around, uh, they're my friends. Uh, part shater them if, uh, if they're here, but I will put that to one side today. Okay, now, so we're going to be looking at naive realism and, and representationalism. And uh, Tyler Burge has, has influentially argued that naive realism is inconsistent with perceptual science, the work done by, by psychologists, neuroscientists, cognitive neuroscientists who work on, on the science of perception. And I'll talk about that a bit. I don't think his, his argument here is particularly compelling. I think there are other problems with naive realism, but I don't think the objection Burge makes is, is by any means conclusive. But what I shall then argue is that representationalism is definitely inconsistent with perceptual science. And so the moral I want to I want to draw at the end of the talk is that we should embrace an alternative to, to both naive realism and representationalism. And that's in fact the view I defend in my, my book. I call it the quantitative view. 
sometimes people discussing it have started calling it the pure paint view, which is a nice graphic description. Maybe we'll uh, get an explanation of, of, of that terminology later. Uh, I'm not especially going to make defending this view a focus of, of today's, today's talk, but I hope in the course of the talk, uh, you'll get a sense of what the view is and what its strengths are. Okay, that's the uh, introduction. Now, Virgin naive realism. And let me first of all explain what naive realism is. I mean, some of you might, who aren't perhaps familiar with it, might find it a, a strange view. It's a view which is uh, embraced by many people in Britain, uh, not so much elsewhere, but uh, there, there's outposts of naive realism uh, all, over, all over the world. Uh, and uh, all right, the view is that conscious sensory experiences are constituted by relations to observed facts. So it's naive view, it's the view that when you consciously, uh, in fact, there's a nice cherry tree out the window here. When you consciously see a cherry tree and it's a uh, uh, white blossom, pink, white blossom, uh, the naive view, you might ask ordinary people, they'll say, well, you know, there's the cherry tree and your mind, because you're looking at it, your eyes are working, is open to it. The, 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 the tree as it were, is embraced by your conscious mind. And the naive realist view is that the, the tree and its shape and the colors of its parts are literally part of your conscious experience. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the view, that's the view. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's arguably a natural view, the first view that ordinary people might come to if they think about experience. But of course, there is uh, an immediate worry about it, which is not that complicated a worry. And many ordinary people might well have this, have this worry as well as the naive view, which is the thought, well, couldn't you be in just that same state? Couldn't it be conscious for you? Couldn't it consciously be for you just the same, couldn't you have exactly the same conscious sensory experience in a case where, let me switch to my example because the, the, the cherry tree's got a bit complicated. Uh, 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 when there's no yellow ball there, so you have the sensory experience of a yellow ball and I really say, well, that's a matter of the yellow ball. There's a yellow ball in front of you. Your mind kind of reaches out and embraces the yellow ball. Uh, and. Uh, now, as people, now you might say, but hang on, can I have just the same experience when there's no yellow ball there? When there's a ball there and it, maybe it's green and the lighting's funny, or maybe there's no ball there at all. I've been ingesting some funny substances, I'm hallucinating. Couldn't I have just the same sensory experience even though there's no, there's no corresponding worldly fact? Uh, and that, that thought is inconsistent with naive realism. Naive realism says the type, that type of sensory experience involves a real yellow ball. And so you can't have the same type of sensory experience when there, when there isn't a yellow ball there. And the naive realists happily embrace this conclusion. They will say, yes, indeed, in the case of, of uh, illusions and hallucinations, you aren't in the same conscious state as you are in the good case where you're perceiving veridically. And then the naive realists have to tell some other kind of story about what's going on in the bad cases. I mean, there's an issue here we might talk about later about exactly where the line between the good and the bad cases comes, but all naive realists agree that there's some bad cases at least where the world isn't involved, it's just a hallucination. And in those cases, what's going on is not the same as the conscious sensory experience you have in the good case. Now, they'll agree that, of course, you can't tell from the inside if you have a convincing hallucination, and maybe the doctors manipulate your brain very carefully. Uh, uh, as of a yellow ball, you can't tell from the inside that what's going on is consciously different from what's going on in the good case, but nevertheless, the naive realists say there is a, a fundamental difference between the conscious experience of the good case and the conscious experience you have in the hallucination. 
Now, we, I'll, I'll come back to this, this issue about uh, uh, it's being a different, a different sensory experience in the bad case, even if you can't tell from the inside. But that's not the point that Burge kicks on. Burge objects that naive realism violates a principle that he thinks is central to perceptual science, in particular, uh, the familiar work in perceptual science that, that studies uh, visual illusions, other, other sensory illusions. And Burge's thought is, look, it's, think about what's going on when people try and understand visual illusions like the Muller Lyre lines or, or color illusions, how, how uh, non-yellow surfaces can produce uh, yellow experiences in, in funny lighting. And Birch says, well, what they figure out is that is that the, the kind of stimulation of your eyes and other relevant senses that you have when you look at a real yellow ball can be engineered in cases where there's no yellow ball there and will produce just the same, just the same uh, uh, sensory result. You can be fooled into thinking there's a yellow ball there by looking at a tromboid painting of a yellow ball. Uh, it's in fact a two-dimensional object, but you, you see it as a, as a, as a three-dimensional object. And Birch says what the scientists are doing is, 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 is they're figuring out how, how uh, the, the same kind of proximal simulation will produce the same uh, perceptual state, even though the distal, the distal source of the proximal stimulation is different. So Burgess thought is it's built into perceptual science that, that uh, you'll be in the same, the same kind of perceptual state, both in the good case where it's produced by a real yellow ball and in the, sometimes people say falsidical cases, in the bad cases, where you have the same proximal stimulation, but there's no yellow ball there. Uh, now, I think Burge is right about how, how uh, vision science, perceptual science generally goes here. They are interested in the way that given internal states are produced by uh, certain kinds of proximal stimulation, even when uh, what's outside the, the subject might vary across those kinds of, that kind of case. But I don't think this is a particularly telling argument against naive realism. Naive realists, I mean, a lot of them responded to Burge and they say, well, then that's, no, that's no news to us. We know how perceptual science works. We know how, how people study visual illusions and so on. And they, they're happy to grant that given the same proximal stimulation, given the same stimulation of the eyes and the uh, other sensory peripheries, you'll get the same internal processes. But they say it doesn't follow that you have the same conscious experience just because you have the same internal processes. They say there'll be two cases, one where the, the uh, internal processes of question are produced by a real yellow ball, and another one where uh, they're produced by uh, maybe uh, uh, scientists carefully uh, stimulating your peripheries to produce the same result. And they'll say, it's been their view from the start that the conscious experience you have in those two cases is different. Uh, the conscious property involved in seeing a yellow ball isn't fixed just by what's going on inside your head, but by that plus the extra fact that there's a real yellow ball there. Your, your uh, perceptual abilities put you in contact with a real yellow ball. And that's part of what it is to be conscious as you are in that case. And when things go wrong and your sensory abilities misfire and uh, 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 produce the same internal result with, without a yellow ball there, you're in a different conscious state, even though, even though uh, they admit you can't tell from inside, unsurprisingly, given what we've just been through, uh, which state you're in. And you will find them saying, well, not, not unreasonably, that that might seem a bit strange, but come on, the whole business of consciousness is a bit strange. Uh, uh, 
and uh, those people who who find our view difficult but are otherwise naturalist physicalists aren't they uh, generally in a bit of a uh, uh, puzzle situation when they're trying to figure out which kinds of physical processes give rise to consciousness and why they do? Isn't there a hard problem for everybody? So you might think some bits of the brain, uh, 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 the back of the brain, the prefrontal cortex uh, suffice for consciousness. And then the uh, you know, block will say, no, no, you don't need the front of the brain at all. And uh, it's very hard to figure out which bits of the brain are responsible for consciousness. Well, maybe what's going on is that part of what's responsible for consciousness is what's outside you. and. Uh, uh, we're, we're in the uh, 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 relation between physical goings on and consciousness. It ruled out that, that the, the factors that contribute co to consciousness must stop, must stop inside your skin. Okay, I, I, I think this is a perfectly reasonable response to Birch. I mean, I find naive realism uh, uh, strange. Uh, and I find the idea that what's going on outside your skin might contribute to your consciousness strange, but uh, that strangeness was there from the start and, and Burge is doing nothing to add to the argument against naive realism. In fact, in the book, I say quite a few things against naive realism, uh, 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 but uh, different from, from Burge's criticism. In fact, one of, one, of, one, of, one of my criticisms, which I borrow from Adam Pouts, does appeal to, to issues from, from perceptual science. Pouts has got a nice little argument saying that naive realism isn't consistent with the way that, with the similarity relations between different kinds of perceptual experiences. For example, he says, if you look at the the surface properties of blue and green and purple things, you'll find that the, the surface properties, reflectance profiles of blue and green things are very similar and of purple things different from both of them. But he says, if you think about the experiences, the, the purple experiences are like blue experiences and uh, green experiences are more different from blue experiences than, than purple experiences are. And he concludes therefore that, uh, well, he conjectures, he adduces some evidence that, that what's going on in the visual cortex, what's going on in V4 is more similar with blue and purple than with blue and green. And he infers from that the experiences must go with what's going on inside the, 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 the head and not, in, not with uh, the nature of the, the objects, the distal objects, the worldly objects of perception. It's an interesting argument. I also mentioned that naive realism seems to have, have more problem with time than space. Uh, I say that you might find it odd that, that my consciousness involves the yellow ball on the other side of the room, but uh, that's weird, but not obviously uh, problematic. But the idea of my consciousness involves things that stopped happening uh, in some cases millions of years ago, but in any case, you know, a few seconds ago, uh, uh, that looks much worse for naive realism. The idea that, that consciousness is, is uh, so oddly located in time seems to me more difficult than the idea that it's so oddly located in space. I mean, as Descartes said, we know where consciousness is in time, we're not so sure where it is in space. And it seems to me, we know it's not uh, going on uh, a million years before uh, intuitively it starts happening. I can see Hanok looking uh, 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 unhappy at this. Uh, Hanok has a very nice paper, uh, not responding to my argument, but, but as it were, uh, anticipating my argument saying that these these considerations don't apply when you take the speed of light and special relativity into account and it's not so obvious these distant events are really in the past but uh, uh, we can leave that for the discussion so that's where we are with naive realism it's it's i think uh, uh, a strange view uh, uh, but i don't think it's inconsistent with perceptual science in the way 
Bird says, though it does face other difficulties. Oh, and I, I didn't mention the most obvious difficulty seems to me uh, the 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 commitment to the idea that two states can be consciously different, even though nobody can tell, even ideal circumstances from the side that they are so different, that you can't tell from the inside that two states are consciously different when they are, seems to me pretty close to contradictory. I lose, I lose my hold on what it is for something to be a conscious experience of a certain kind if differences in kind between conscious experiences are never available to the subject. Uh, maybe naive realists will say, well, you know, we don't really want to be talking about consciousness. That's not the important thing of them. Sometimes they say we're just talking about fundamental kinds of experience. Uh, that would be all right. I'm interested in, in the nature of conscious sensory experience and the idea that the Conscious existential experiences can be different, even though the subjects can't tell even ideal circumstances, they are so different. Uh, that seems to me the basic difficulty facing naive realism. Let me turn to representationalism, because I said naive realism is popular in Britain, there's outposts elsewhere, but it's still, I think, pretty much a minority view in the philosophy of perception and the main view is representationalism. And what I want to show you now is that representationalism really is in trouble with, with uh, perceptual science in a way naive realism isn't. So representationalism says that your conscious state when you see a yellow ball is a matter of your representing there to be a yellow ball in front of you, not a matter of your being in relation to an actual one. And so representationalists don't have the same difficulty with the bad cases. They say it's the same conscious state in the bad cases as well as the good. If I'm having an illusion that a ball is yellow when it's actually green, or if I'm uh, hallucinating from the start that there's a ball there that's yellow, there's nothing there. I'm still in the same state as when there is a real yellow ball there because across all those cases, I'm representing there to be a yellow ball, which I can perfectly well do when what's in front of me isn't actually a yellow ball. So it's the same conscious state in the bad cases as well as the good, no difficulties with Burgess proximal principle, and no need to present, postulate conscious differences that are internally undetectable. So you might think representation, I'm sure so far you will think representation is, I mean, Maybe there's some naive realists here, but I think uh, uh, people who aren't familiar with the philosophy of perception will be thinking, yeah, representations, and that's that's obviously the right the, the right view here. But not too quickly. What I'm going to explain to you is the representationalism of people in the philosophy of perception is a far more committed and strange view than. Uh, uh, what's implied by what I've said so far about representations. Suppose we distinguish the vehicles of representation from their representational contents. So we have, we have uh, uh, states which uh, represent things to be a certain way. And you might want to distinguish the, the state considered maybe as a physical state, uh, neural state, state of the brain, and then the fact that it has a certain content. I mean, the analogy I want you to think about is uh, the way that words have meanings. So words of English, uh, uh, think of them just as marks on paper or sounds in the air. Those are the vehicles of representation. And then as it happens, in virtue of the way they're used by speakers of English, those words have, have meanings. In that case, it's very natural to distinct, distinguish between the, the physical objects that, that carry the meanings and the meanings themselves. And thinking about that kind of analogy, you might think representationalism in the philosophy of mind is the view that our conscious sensory experiences are constituted by the neural vehicles of representation. 
So when there's certain neural activities in V4, say, then, then that's like a word in the language of thought. Just it happens represents the presence of a yellow ball, but it's it's the internal processes, the words in the language of thought that fix the fix the consciousness, fix what it's like for me. And then in addition, you might suppose that these neural states are representations. They're, they're systematically correlated with features of the environment and they guide behavior accordingly. Just in the way that, that words are correlated with features of the environment by the ways we use them. You might think that, that our, our neural states are correlated with features of the environment. I mean, those, those neural oscillations in V4 are, are systematically uh, caused except in deceptive circumstances by, by the presence of yellow balls and they'll guide your behavior in a way appropriate to, to yellow balls. And you might think that, okay, so think of the word meaning analogy. There's, there's the, the states inside the head, they fix the consciousness. And then as it happens, they, they uh, are systematically correlated with the environment and constituted as representations in that way. Now, that's basically my qualitative view of, of uh, sensory experience. Uh, uh, sensory experiences are internal states. As I'm a physicalist, I think they're grounded in, grounded in neural states. That's, that's the essence of the conscious sensory experience. But as it happens, those conscious sensory experiences do have representational contents in virtue of their correlations with features of the environment. Now, that's my qualitative view. I think it's a perfectly natural view. I think it's the view that most people outside the philosophy of perception who think about these matters, no doubt, no doubt hold. I think that most, most neuroscientists, most cognitive scientists hold it, most philosophers outside the philosophy of perception think this. Uh, uh, I think most, most intelligent high school kids probably think this, but in fact, it's not the view that goes under the heading of representationalism in the philosophy of perception. I mean, here's, here's two, two symptoms of this. I'll start with two symptoms. Uh, I take it that, that when I see my wife walking down the road past the window, that I have a conscious sensory experience that represents to me that my wife is walking down the road. I mean, I, I think that, that, that if, if uh, it was some other woman who, who looked like my wife was walking down the road, uh, that I would be misrepresenting what was going on. I would be seeing my wife to be walking down the road when she is. I take it that we have a, a bit of our brain, the fusiform face area, that's dedicated to recognizing particular people via their faces. And I take it that the activity of the fusiform face area- uh, I couldn't find uh, that in your- makes a difference to my conscious sensory experience. And so I take it my conscious sensory experience is representing my wife, that particular woman. And if another woman fools me into having the same conscious sensory experience, it's misrepresented to her. That seems to me a perfectly natural, natural thought. And I, I, I take it that that's a thought that would be supported by people working on the neuroscience of face recognition. But representationalists in the philosophy of, of perception don't allow that. They don't allow that sensory experiences can represent particular people. They don't allow singular contents. They say, no, no, that can't be right. All that your sensory experience has the power to represent is that there's a certain appearance before you. A woman with a certain appearance is walking down the street and, and you've, you, you won't have misrepresented if you, if you uh, have the same sensory experience in response to a woman who's not your not your wife. Okay, so that's that's one symptom of the fact that representationalism is a, a slightly funny view. And and you know you you can read thousands of articles by representationalists trying to explain what it is exactly that your sensory experience in that case represents if it's not your particular wife. And and they get into a lot of Difficulties about that. Uh, similar kind of case the other way around. I take it that two people can differ consciously while representing 
the same surface color. There's quite a lot of neuroscience now on, on interpersonal differences in, in color representation and plausibly in color experience. They're, they're tetrachromats. There's quite a few people who have, have uh, extra color receptors in their retina. And I take it that for them, looking at certain colors will be different than it is for me. There's also the phenomenon that, that different people uh, uh, experience pure colors, pure red with no, no blue or yellow mixed at different points in the, in the spectrum. So that gives reason to suppose that, that here's different people. They have different sensory feelings and what it's like for them is different when they, when they represent a certain kind of surface color. I mean, mostly when they represent that color, they'll be representing accurately. The thing in front of them will have that color. Put two people in front of that, that particular shade, they will have somewhat different experiences. But representationalists and philosophy perception don't like that either. That's, that's the idea that there's mental pain, that there's some, some aspect of the feeling that goes with your sensory experience that, that is over and above what's being represented. And they don't feel that's, that's right. They want to say, if it's the same thing being represented, the feeling has to be the same. Now, you might wonder, given the plausibility of the idea I sketched out, that right, sensory experiences are internal neural states, which as it happens are correlated with the feature and environment, you might wonder why, why are the representationists and the philosophy of perception against these kinds of possibilities? And the answer is that they're not just representationalists in the everyday scientific sense I outlined, they're essential representationists. They think that the character and the content, the conscious feeling and the content of sensory representations are essentially tied together. And that's in fact because the representations of the perception uh, have pretty much all got bigger fish to fry. Now, now we come to two different camps in the philosophy of perception. There's, there's naturalist representationalists, the leading uh, representatives are Michael Tai, uh, Fred Gretzky, maybe nowadays Alex, Alex Byrne, I'm not so sure about Alex Byrne, naturalist representationalists, and they want to reduce consciousness to representation. They want to give an explanation of consciousness. They want to say, We've got an account, remember I said earlier, the hard problem, where is their consciousness and why they said, we've got an account of where there's consciousness. There's consciousness when there's representation. In fact, most of them say there's consciousness when there's representation, plus a few extra things. But basically they want to explain consciousness in terms of representation. So, so they don't think of uh, uh, representation as somehow, connected to the conscious feeling via the fact that, that uh, the internal neural states are correlated with certain features of the environment. They think that consciousness and representation are, are uh, intrinsically tied together. Once you've got the right kind of representation, well then bingo, that gives you, gives you consciousness. There's a Another group of philosophers who in a way are diametrically opposed, but agree in thinking that consciousness and representation in the sensory realm are essentially tied together. And these are the phenomenal intentionality uh, uh, enthusiasts. Uriah Kriegel has coined the term the phenomenal intentionality research program. I'm gonna call the people in that camp phenomenal intentionalists. And they're interested in doing things the other way around. They find not consciousness puzzling, they find representation puzzling. They think representation is uh, uh, just trying to think uh, a deep and central feature of, of our world, certainly our experienced world. They don't find the idea that representation is just a matter of correlations between words and 
and things or neural states and things very plausible. They think representation is something that falls out of the structure of consciousness. They will say, just reflect on the nature of what's going on when you have an experience of a yellow ball, isn't it? That's what real representation is, the, the connection between the structure of your experience and, and presenting a yellow ball to be there. So they want to explain consciousness. So they want to explain representation in terms of consciousness. Now the differences between these two camps that make a bit of a difference to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm slurring over some distinctions I want to, might want to make when attending to these different, different positions. But for now, I just want to put to you that both these camps are committed to not just a, a as it happens association, but an equation of character properties, how it feels for you when you're having a sensory experience and representational properties, what it is that you're experiencing. So they don't think of experiences like words that have their, their contents because of contingent connections to environmental conditions. They think of experiences as things that have their contents built in. I mean, the phenomenal intentionalists think that have the contents built in because given the structure of the conscious experience, representation follows. The naturalists, representationalists do it the other way around. They think given the kind of representing you're doing, the consciousness follows. But either way, they think that the, the, the experiences have their contents built in. So they think a given kind of experience means a given kind of sensory content, a representational content, and vice versa. So there's no room for different wives to be represented by the same experience. If you've got the experience, then the representational content falls out. Uh, nothing more is needed to say what the experience is representing. So no room for different wives to be represented by the same experience. And conversely, uh, there's no room for the same color to be represented by different experiences. Uh, 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 the, same, same, same feeling, same uh, represented content. Notice that on my view, the view I sketched earlier, which I'm now gonna call contingent representationism, there's nothing, nothing puzzling here at all. There's no, there's no reason why exactly the same neural, neural oscillation shouldn't represent my wife to me and represent, say, a different woman to my Australian doppelganger who's got a very similar looking wife. And so exactly the same neural excitations in him will produce the same feeling, but represent a different wife. Nor is there anything puzzling on my view that there's you with... Uh, your uh, tetrochromatically uh, uh, stimulated uh, 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 V4 and me with my rather more impoverishedly stimulated V4 and we have different neural vehicles, but they, we use them to track the same color, same content, uh, different, different conscious experience. So in my view, there's no, there's no puzzle about, about the content and the uh, conscious character coming apart, but representationalism in the philosophy of perception doesn't allow this. Representational as foster perception is essential representationalism and doesn't allow for the feeling and the represented content to come apart. Okay, now from now on when I talk about representationalism, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mean the representationalism of the philosopher's perception. And uh, uh, I'm gonna try and show you that this view is wrong and indeed inconsistent with scientific investigation into, into conscious sensory experience. I, mean, I certainly think that the representationalism of the philosophy of perception is a strange view. Uh, I think it's even stranger than naive realism. I mean, the thought that if the same vehicle had represented something different, it would make the feeling different, or if a different vehicle had represented the same thing, it would stop the vehicles feeling different. I find that, that 
very strange. But strangeness is not an argument. I want to give you an argument, and I'm coming to that. And the argument is going to be that, that uh, uh, this view of sensory experience really doesn't fit together with the way sensory experience gets studied uh, in, in cognitive science. But first, I want to quickly consider something that, that tends to hide the strangeness of this representation of this view. And this is the idea of the transparency of experience. So many representationists, not all, but many in both camps, both the naturalist representationists and the phenomenal intentionists, appeal to the transparency of experience. And what this means is they appeal to the fact that introspection supposedly shows that worldly properties like yellow and round are present in our experience. So the thought is that here I am, I'm looking at a yellow ball, there really is a yellow ball, let's suppose. And, and now the thought is, well, reflect on the nature of your experience. Think about, think about, uh, properties, the properties displayed by that experience. I mean, it's a conscious experience. You, you're able to, to turn your mind to its nature introspectively. And when you do that, don't you find that the properties, yellow and round, are present in your experience? And, and many representationists use this to mot motivate the idea that sensory experiences are essentially representational. As the thought is that that whether or not there's something yellow and round outside you, at least your experience is displaying yellow and round, and to that extent, it's representing the world outside you to instantiate the properties that are in the experience itself. So that the crucial idea here is that the worldly properties like yellow and roundness can be parts of our experiences. And here's, I mean, two classic Cases. I mean, the thoughts first pushed by Harmon. Uh, he invites you to think about it. your experience you have when looking at a tree. And he says, if you try and introspect the, the properties of your experience, the only features you'll find to turn your attention to will be features of the presented tree. The only properties that you can find there in your experience are, are leaf shapedness, greenness, brownness, and so on. Here's Michael Tai telling us what it's like for him to look at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what I found so pleasing about the experience in question, what I was focusing on was a certain shade and intensity of the color blue. The color blue being the kind of property that, uh, not such a great case because it's not clear the sea actually is blue, but shirts, my shirt, uh, that, uh, that kind of property. So in your experience is the property that shirts can have. And for many representationists on both sides, it's this thought that, that uh, is appealed to to make the view seem plausible. Now, in fact, I think this idea that these worldly properties are present in experience, while it seems kind of okay at first pass, should be viewed with deep suspicion. I don't think this idea stands up to much examination. And the reason is that representationists, are, as it said, common factor theorists, their big setting point against naive realism was that you have the same kind of conscious experience in the bad cases as well as the good cases. And so it's gonna be a consequence of the line now being pushed that the properties yellow and round are gonna be present in an illusory experience of a yellow ball as well. So here I am, I'm having an illusion of a yellow ball. Let's suppose there's a ball there, but it's not actually yellow, it's, it's, it's green, right? But the property yellow is still present in my experience. At this point, I think we should start getting very worried. I mean, how is the property yellow present in your experience? And that's a way for a property yellow to be around, to be in the vicinity is for something to be yellow and the ball to be yellow. Uh, uh, but in this case, nothing's yellow. 
the, there's no yellow ball here. Uh, uh, my brain's not yellow. My, my neurons aren't yellow. I'm not yellow. Uh, the experience isn't yellow, uh, but still somehow yellowness is supposed to be present in the experience. And I find this difficult to make any sense of. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm telling the representation is something they haven't noticed. I mean, here's Dretzky, I'll read it out. I mean, in hallucinating pink rats, we're aware of something pink and rat shaped, but we're not aware of any object that has those properties. We're aware of pure universals, uninstantiated properties. Uh, so the thought is that this is property pink and the property of being rat shaped. And there, you know, I'm, I'm with Gretzky, those are real properties, all right? They're properties things can have. But in the case we are thinking of, they're not locally manifest. They're up in property space still, uh, wherever properties live when they're not being possessed by objects. And some are qua objects up in property space. Gretzky's happy to think of them as universals. Uh, they're something that we're aware of. Our mind is in contact. Our mind somehow attends to these, uh, these entities outside space and time, and that we're attending to these entities outside space and time, nevertheless constitutes our conscious experience. And I think we should get off the bus here. I can make no sense of this. Uh, and I conclude that the whole transparency line of thought is a mistake. I don't think that uh, the properties we instantiate when we have experiences, the feelings we have, which I agree are naturally thought of as involving the worldly properties yellow and round, I don't think they have any essential connection with worldly properties. I just think it's not true that the properties yellow and round, the kind of properties that objects can have are in any sense present in our experience. What's going on is that we have uh, internal conscious qualitative features, uh, it feels a certain way for us. That's what we are pointing to. And when we think about the experience involving the property yellow, but, but the, the, the kind of conscious experience we have in that case that we tend to describe in those terms has no essential connection with worldly properties like yellow and roundness. Having said that, I mean, let me just uh, uh, flag a little kind of footnote. Uh, gets much more complicated if you have certain kinds of theories of colors. If you've got a dispositionless theory of color, then I'd have to qualify what I just said. But think about roundness. I think the, the feeling we have when we see something round has no essential connection with roundness as a property of objects. Okay. So far, I'm just stating positions. I'm not gonna give you an argument. I'm gonna show you why uh, uh, representationalism is no good, and in particular, why it's in tension with perceptual science. Okay, I'm watching the clock, but it's, it, it's gonna go quite quickly now. Uh, uh, I take it to be a presupposition of perceptual science. I mean, such an obvious presupposition so is scarcely ever to be uh, made explicit. The conscious sensory experiences have causes and effects. That's how we find out about it. We, we, there's a lot of scientific research into uh, uh, conscious sensory experiences. Uh, in particular, which brain activities give rise to conscious sensory experiences, which don't, and, uh, and uh, what kinds of conscious experiences are produced by which brain activities. And what we do when we investigate this is we cause the conscious sensory experiences by producing various stimulations, uh, putting subjects into various conditions. And then we uh, 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 try and detect which experiences occur by noting their effects. And most obviously, we ask the subjects to report on their experiences. But in some cases, no report paradigms and so on. We feel that we're not so happy with that as the only sign of whether states are conscious. And we try and look for other effects of the states. 
But it's essential to scientific research into conscious sensory experiences that we take these to be states that have causes and effects. And what I'm going to try and show you now is that the way representationalists think of sensory experiences is not consistent with that. Representationalists account of sensory experiences renders them the kinds of states that can't have causes and effects. Now, I'm going to assume some, some metaphysics of causation here. I don't take it to be controversial. We might, we might talk about it. I take it that the relata of causation, the things that have causes and effects, are the instantiations of first order properties like yellow and round. It's when some physical object possesses the kinds of properties that physical objects possess, that's when we get a concrete fact that can have causes and effects. I mean, there'll be more complicated cases, there'll be physical objects in relations, uh, uh, one object is next to another, that's the kind of thing that can have causes and effects, and so on. But the things that have causes and effects are, are first order physical objects having instantiating first order properties. But the representationists who appeal to transparency are thinking of sensory experiences as constituted by some non-instantiation relation to properties outside space and time. Here's me, there's the property of yellow, the property of round, and nothing nearby instantiates the properties of yellow and round, rather I attend to, or I focus on, or I'm aware of these properties outside space and time, abstracted from the instantiations in themselves. I say that if that's what sensory experiences are, they, they won't have any causes and effects. Relations to abstract properties outside space and time, other than instantiation, just aren't the kinds of facts. I mean, I don't deny that we can be in relation to properties as such. I don't deny that, that it's a fact that I'm related to the property yellowness in itself. I'm gonna give you an example of, of just such a relation in a minute, but I don't think my being in a relation to the property of yellowness in itself with nothing nearby being instantiated is the kind of fact that can have causes and effects. It's too abstract a fact. Okay, so I'm saying that the representationists who appeal to transparency, who say the conscious sensory experiences are constituted by the relation of attending to a universal property outside space and time, they've ended up with a picture of conscious sensory experience that's not consistent with the truth that conscious sensory experiences have causes and effects. That kind of fact doesn't seem to me the kind of thing that can have any effects. Now, you might say, well, okay, so now, now you're jumping on this idea of transparency. And maybe you've, you've produced a good argument against, against the idea that uh, uh, there will be properties literally present in experiences. But not all representationalists are happy with this idea. There's a number of representations I can think of, uh, Charles Seawood for one, Uriah Kriegel, who are uneasy with this idea of these uninstantiated properties being present in experience. And they want to distance themselves from that. But I don't think that gets representationalists off the hook. The trouble is that representational properties themselves have the same structure as these supposed relations of attending to abstract properties. Representational properties themselves are non-instantiation relations to abstract properties living in property space outside space and time. Take the case where I represent something to be round. I mean, I, said that, I, I think that's something I can do. I think I can leave something to be run, I can have a visual experience, which on my view represents, represents the object in front of me to be round. 
I don't think it's intrinsic to my visual experience that it represents the object to be run, but I do think it does uh, in virtue of being generally correlated with round things. And, and so I can represent an object to be round and suppose that the object in front of me isn't actually round. Well, now here I am, uh, I'm in a relation of representing something to be, I'm in relation to the property roundness. And, and now I'm in relation to an abstract property. Nothing, the property roundness isn't instantiated anywhere. All we've got is the abstract fact of me representing something to be round, where round now is an ab abstract property outside space and time. That's not a very concrete fact. That's a relation between me and an abstract property. And so I think that kind of property the property of representing something be round is itself not the kind of property that has any causes and effects. So any representation who equates the property of having an experience that feels a certain way with the property of representing something to be thus and so is open to the subjection. They've, rep they've, they've construed experiences as things that have no causal potency. You might be worried at this point, well, ha haven't I argued myself in a position where representation itself is unscientific? No, I don't think representation is unscientific. It's just I don't think that representation, instantiation of a representational property, my representing something to be such and so, isn't the kind of thing that has causes and effects. So representational properties are fine, but they aren't causally potent. But conscious properties are causally potent. So conscious properties can't be representational properties. Just to wrap up quickly, here's how I think about representation. I think when we ascribe a representational property, when we say of somebody, they're representing that ball to be round, we do two things. First of all, we attribute an internal vehicle which does have causal powers to cause other internal vehicles and, and eventually to cause behavior. So we, we say inside the subject is a state, it's a physicalist, I think of this neural state, will interact with other such states to generate behavior. But I don't think that really involves representation. There's nothing in that story about the thing inside bearing some relation to a possible further circumstance, anything representing. What happens when we, we characterize the subject of representing is that we're indicating a certain further possible causal explanation. We're saying that this state is such that if its truth condition obtains, this state is associated with a condition. And if that condition obtains, then the behavior, let's imagine the person wants to kick a round thing, right? When we say they're they want to kick a round thing and they represent a round thing to be in front of them. First thing we, we say is that they've got an internal state and that will make them kick. But we're also saying that if there really is a ball there, if, if uh, uh, their representational state is true, then not only will they kick out, but they'll succeed in moving an actual ball. So that rather complicated story is what we get out of representation. But note that what has the effect in the case where the effects are more than just the person kicking out, but the ball moving, is the concrete fact of a round ball being present, not the abstract fact that the subject was representing that. The fact that the subject was representing that was just pointing us to the possibility that, that if he wasn't just representing it, but also the representation was true, then there actually would be a round ball there to be kicked and a ball would get moved. So, so representation doesn't have causes and effects itself. It just programs for possible causal explanations. So, right, I'm gonna stop talking. I've been talking on that. Uh, now we see that representationalism, the strong representationalism of the representationalism philosophy of perception violates an obvious presupposition of perceptual science, that conscious experiences have causes and effects. 
representational facts have the wrong shape to fit that bill. If you, if you construe conscious experiences as representational facts, you'll end up viewing conscious experiences as the kinds of things that can't have any effects. And that looks like very bad for representationalism. Just to wrap things up, note that naive realism doesn't face the problem I've been pushing here. Naive realism construes experiences as concrete facts. I mean, slightly complicated conscious concrete relational facts, but here I am, I have the experience. It's a matter of my looking at an actual yellow ball. There's the real yellow ball in front of me. I'm related to it by my eyes being open and my looking at it and everything working. And, and that kind of fact seems to me just the kind of thing that can have effects. And indeed, it's the kind of fact that will explain why the ball moves when I kick out. There really is a ball there. So the objection I'm raising is not, not a problem for naive realism, but it is for representationalism. So to conclude, uh, while the question of why naive realism is in conflict with science is, is a rather uh, complex and contested one, it seems to me that representationalism certainly is in conflict with perceptual science and should be rejected for that reason. So that's it, I've got to end. Thank you very much for bearing through bearing through that. Thank you very much, David. How shall we do this? Shall I stop sharing? And then uh, we can yeah, always... you can stop sharing and then if necessary, you can, you good, can good. share it again. Uh, so we will, we will proceed with, uh, with a Q&A now. Um, so if you have a question, just type a Q in the chat instead of raising your hand. And that way we have a chronological order of questions or simply type your question. Um, and so we already have one question from, uh, 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 let me see, there are so many direct messages uh, from uh, Maureen Ellis. So I'm just gonna read it. She says, David, you're exemplifying representation as re-presentation that is the yellow ball or flowering tree presents and represents itself to individual perception. And we as individuals represent what we receive either in uh, what we report, write, say. In other words, qualia is an individual iconic semiotic experience, question mark. So as some would say, the past is history, the future a mystery. All we have is the present. That's why it's called the present. Pre-sent. Two question marks. Are we spending out a complex web of uh, Jung's collective consciousness? Question mark. Let me just. Well, I maybe others others here have thought about this more. Uh, the terminology of representation, the etymology of the term is interesting and kind of philosophically provocative. Uh, so you re-present something, something that's perhaps not present, somehow you make it to be present by this act of representation. Uh, uh, maybe that's, that's a thought that that goes with the transparency idea that uh, here's uh, yellowness. Uh, maybe the thing in front of you really isn't yellow, but you make the yellow present again and thereby portray yellowness to be instantiated beyond you. Uh, I mean, if, if that's part of the, the etymology of the term representation, perhaps I ought to find a different word for what I think of as representation, because I don't think it's, it is a matter of representing the objects. It's a matter of, of uh, being in a state that in some sense answers to the presence of certain properties without representing them. But still, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that this uh, etymology of representing something is still part of the 
the concept of representation as used by by philosophers and scientists nowadays. All right. The next question is from uh, Francisco Pereira. So go ahead, Francisco. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and, and David. David. Um, okay. So you you somehow present this uh, dilemma mm -hmm. of causal efficiency of uh, yeah. conscious mental states. So I was wondering if you see any prospect on a sort of pluralist mixed view in which successful uh, perceptions actually do have both relational plus representational problems, uh, properties, sorry. So in the successful case, you can explain the uh, causal efficiency of the conscious experience appealing to the underlying relational structure. And in the sort of um, hallucinatory case, for example, you can explain the way um, the experiences feel just appealing to the representational properties. And at the same time, you have a sort of explanation why those experiences are not really successful uh, when kicking a ball, for example. So that's that's the, the the first question. If you see any prospect, I know you have like uh, independent reasons for holding that there are uh, sort of conscious conscious intrinsic properties apart from representational ones. But I'm just thinking about that mixed possibility, relational plus representational. And I'm and the second I'm, question, I'm, David. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm seeing. I I, I I think the things I said today give an argument against the view you have in mind. I, I don't think I need any additional arguments. So think about what's going on in the hallucinatory case. You want to say, well, in that case, can't we account for the conscious feeling we have in that case purely in terms of the the representational fact, or maybe in part in terms of representational fact that we're representing there to be a yellow ball. And I want to say no, I mean, the conscious experience we have in the hallucinatory case is a thing that has effects in particular, has effects on your behavior. Like when you say it's for me right now as if I was looking at a real yellow ball. And we take that to be, when you say that, uh, something caused by your conscious sensory experience. You're instantiating a certain conscious property. And I don't think the property of representing there to be a yellow round thing in front of you can have any effects. I mean, that in itself never has any effects. So, so I say you have to think of the conscious sensory property as constituted by something intrinsic. Uh, as a physicalist, I'm going to say it's going to be constituted by something physical. But I mean, a lot of these arguments will work just the same if you were a dualist, but would have to be constituted by some intrinsic mind stuff, and not by some uh, different kind of relation to an abstract property outside space and time. That a relation to an abstract property outside space and time just doesn't look like the kind of thing that can have effects. But your hallucinatory experience does have effects. So the argument bites even in, in that kind of case. Okay. Yeah, no, I, can, I, I can see the point, I mean, against the, 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 the representational property in that case. So, so I would think about in what sense we can have a story in which the, the, the relational property is useful for this and accept the epiphenomenal representational property at the same time. But, but that's a different story. I, I, I'm not sure about that. And, and the second point, David, I don't want to make more, more claims. We're talking about perception. Um, it, the, your intuitions are the same in the case of uh, um, mnemonic properties. Like uh, when we remember um, the causal effects of uh, a memory state, uh, but usually representations about perception are also representational is about memory states. But in the case of memory states, we don't have like a, an actual property instantiated in a physical object out there. So, and we all agree that memory states do have effects in our behavior. So you would give a similar story in that case? Yes, I mean, I'd have to spell it out. And 
I'm just trying to think about how important it would be to spell this out outside the particular context we're now in. But of course, I'd want to say, yes, there's a, a vehicle of your memory and that will uh, have causes and effects and that will account for the way that uh, like, all the kind of stuff that people are thinking of in terms of internal causal roles and uh, uh, so on that that will all happen but that all happens independently of the fact that 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 intrinsic state uh, uh, has a representational responsibility to some further fact and if you want to know what gets explained or illuminated by the fact the internal state has this representational content then that will be something more uh, different from just the, the uh, uh, internal causal role effects of the vehicle. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be you know, a two-factor theorist through and through. And uh, one thing is the internal causal roles of the vehicle. The other thing is the, as it were, vertical relationships to distal circumstance. And I'll generally give a, a success semantics -y kind of account of the significance of the representational content. Uh, but I don't think the kind of two-factor way I'm dividing things up only works on a success semantic account of, of uh, what's going on with representation. I think if you had some more general photo style causal account of what's going on with representation, uh, the story for today would come out the same. Okay, okay, thank you. So the next one is, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, uh, Jibei Gu. Uh, let me just unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you, uh, David. It's, uh, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, my question uh, is concerning uh, the causal power of representational property. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, uh, let's consider the veridical case, uh, perception, let's say, saying, uh, saying something. It seems to me that it's not the property of the uh, object we're seeing cause the uh, following uh, uh, belief or behavior. It seems to me that it's a, it's a fact that uh, I say something, then I behave uh, in a certain way. So it's not the property itself causing uh, my uh, following behavior or belief. Similarly, I think um, uh, for, uh, for representation, is a purpose if you will say something like, oh, uh, I recognize uh, representational property um, mm -hmm. because uh, when, uh, for example, when uh, we are in hallucination, if it's a representation, uh, if it's a representing, then in some sense we are we are recognizing the uh, the content or the representational property. So it seemed to me that this uh, this, this hallucination itself or the uh, the recognition of the hallucination. Uh, the, uh, experience uh, co causes the following uh, belief or cognitive state or behavior. So um, my point is that uh, why you insist that uh, it's a uh, property uh, plays a causal power? I'm, I'm not sure I got the trust of that. I mean, so one, one thing I was assuming is that now, I was brought up to think that the relata of causation are facts uh, by Hugh Meller. But I mean, I'm thinking here of facts as uh, possessions of properties by objects. So what's really doing the work in, in my story is the idea that the relata of causation somehow involve property instantiations. So they could be Kim events or they could be facts or they could be instantiations of properties, but those are the kinds of things that enter into causal relations. Now, was your question about that or was it? Yeah, it, it's about that. It was about that. So have I answered the question? I, I mean, um, we, yeah. uh, let's see, if, uh, if the factor is the recognition itself, uh, of course the recognition in a hallucination is not a colorful or is not, it doesn't have a, a shape or something. Uh, so in this sense, you're right that uh, uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the mental state itself uh, doesn't instantiate uh, the 
is a property. Right. Um, ah, but but in that case, I'm I'm going to say. But but the fact so itself, I, 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 want to, I, 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 I do want to say. Okay, let, let me just put my position, uh, and and then I do want to say that when I have the conscious feeling that goes with normally looking at a yellow ball, but it sometimes occurs without that, that there is a property around. It's a conscious property. It's a property of feeling a certain way. And I, as, as the physical object, as the subject, will instantiate that property. And now mm -hmm. we have a concrete fact that can have, have causes and effects. So, I mean, the book I'm rather careful. I, I say, I, I mean, I'm interested in, in conscious properties, representational properties, their properties of me. Uh, and uh, I want to think of, of uh, sensory experiences as instantiations of properties by me. So for me, my sensory state is, is me instantiating the property of feeling a certain way. The representationists want to equate that with me instantiating a representational property. And in effect, my argument is that's no good because uh, we want the property I instantiate when I have a conscious sensory experience to be the kind of property which when instantiated has causes and effects. Oh, and okay. and okay. instantiation representational properties per se doesn't have causes and effects. So uh, ergo, the property I instantiate when I have conscious sensory experience isn't a representational property. I mean, I think it's a physical property. Uh, dualists might think it's a mind stuffy property, but everybody I say should think it's not a representational property. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's helpful. All right. Uh, the next in line is Robert Zabrowski. Uh, so let me just unmute mute you and can I ask your question. Okay. Go ahead, Robert. Robert, I. Yes, yes, please. Uh, it's not a part of a problem coming from the fact that roundness and yellowness are not the same kind of property. I mean, yeah, the yeah. roundness probably is something to be represented because if I touch with my hands, I also feel that it is more or less round. While there is not something like a yellowness, I, I, I guess I, I think that in fact this is the A and human uh, A and the brain of, of human mind that is represented, presenting, not representing this exact uh, length wave in such a way. So if we put too many properties in the same uh, box, maybe we are coming confused and. Uh, some, I don't know, you are, you, you are, you, there is no problem in putting all this in the same, same box. Good, I agree. And, and uh, in my book, I say a bit more about, about both kinds of properties. And I mean, there's, there's more to say about color properties and more to say about shape properties than I said today i'm not think wondering which uh, given your question in the chat i'm wondering whether you're thinking one thing about color properties is it's okay as i said it up there's the feeling i have when i'm presented by yellow things that's one property there's the property that yellow things themselves have when they're yellow that's another property and as I've said it up, these two properties are metaphysically constitutionally independent. It's just that we happen to use the feeling one to represent the surface one. Now, in fact, that claim I just made would be denied by people who are dispositionalists about colors. They say what it is for an object to be colored is for it to be disposed to produce a certain kind of sensory response. And on that view, there is some metaphysical dependency between color experiences and color properties of objects. So I would need to take that into account. I mean, even if we say that, it's a further thing to say 
that while the color feeling might be tied up with the color surface property in that way, that might be true. It doesn't yet follow that the color feeling represents the color surface property. That's another difficulty. And uh, even if we complicated the, the story about colors in that way, the, the, the issue about the color feeling being a representational property would still remain. So that's one issue. When it comes to the shape properties, you might feel that it's built into the conscious feeling of roundness that it's going to make you, as you put it, shape your hands out in a certain way. And that does uh, uh, look like it is built into the conscious feeling of roundness, that it's representing physical roundness. I'm inclined to say not too fast. I agree it's built into the conscious feeling of roundness that it's going to link up internally with certain dispositions to action, to certain motor signals, that, that the internal causal role of the experience is arguably part of what constitutes the feeling of the experience. I'm happy to grant that. Whether that ties you up to real roundness in the physical world, that looks like a further thing. Think about Neo in the Matrix. He's got dispositions to behavior inside the Matrix that goes with his round experiences. I don't think while he's still inside the matrix that that's linking up to real roundness yet. That depends on the, the, the subject, the internal subject uh, being, being embedded in an appropriate environment. So there's complications on both sides, but I don't think either of them undermine my, my basic point. No, this is not about undermining, but for that's example, okay. you're speaking about behavior and uh, reasons and uh, causes and effects is not that uh, roundness um, in some way forces me more or I am more committed to take into consideration roundness, the yellowness in my behavior or in the way I behave. No, no I, look, I, I agree. I, I, I think shapes are different from colors in, 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 in just this respect. The, the, there's a, I think, an intrinsic built-in connection between shape experiences and certain dispositions to behavior. I mean, as we've seen, the obvious, uh, I want to portray it by how I'm going to move my hands. Uh, and that's absent in colors. There's, there's no behavior that yellowness, I mean, there's a kind of very thin thought that redness goes with fruit you're going to put into your mouth. But by and large, uh, there's no behaviors that goes with colors in the way the obvious behaviors that go with shapes. So I grant you that entirely. Uh, I don't think that's enough to show that the, the shape experiences represent those worldly shapes. And I just invite you to think about Brains in the Vats or Neo in the, the Matrix film, where it looks like we have everything needed to give you the shape experiences with certain inclinations to behavior, but the states of Neo's uh, brain when he's in the, the vat aren't, aren't linked up, aren't representing real, real shapes, but just shapes in the Matrix. Thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions or comments? Uh, in the meantime, um, uh, Maureen Ellis said, uh -huh, there is one. OK, Ryan, so let me find you to unmute you in just a sec. Uh, Sorry, I have to find you in the list. Um, uh, I can see Ryan, but maybe he's not in the same place for you. 
Uh, no. So he's he, waving. He's waving. He's. Uh, yeah. So ah, he's, David, he's got headphones and okay. a moustache. I'm muted. Go ahead. Hi, David. How are you doing? I hope I'm fine. The moustache is new. It's, it, it <laughs> yes. Looks, yes. It, it looks good. Oh, thank you. The moustache yeah. and no hair as well. I cut it all off earlier. Uh, yeah. You get bored when you're stuck inside for a year. Um, <laughs> um, so I had a question um, and uh, about how to understand the causal powers of representational properties as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if a representationalist could also use a consumer system style uh, thought about what it is to be a representational property and sort of cut between the representationalist view you're arguing against and your own view. Yeah. So mightn't they say something like, what it is to represent a property is to have a consumer system consume a, 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 a vehicle in such a way that, that the consumption of that vehicle is what it means to represent red or is what it means to represent brown. And that consumption of the vehicle does have causal properties and it's what would allow for the, con and the consumption of the vehicle is what it means for it to, is what constitutes a representational content. Wouldn't that allow for these uh, representational properties to have causal powers and allow for them to be the same in the good and the bad case and not um, uh, violate some presuppositions of perceptual science in terms of Okay, well, let's uh, cause a manipulation. Let's do it. So Ryan, Ryan's filling in some details of the theory of representation, which I'm very attached to, the, 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 the Tito semantic theory of representation. Could you try that? Uh, and and uh, the way Ruth Millican uh, uh, very helpfully sets it up is is the idea that if you have a, a vehicle what what renders it a representation is that there's some system think in humans or primates the, the motor system that consumes the vehicle in the sense it 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 responds to the vehicle with different with a certain behavior if there's a range of different possible vehicles uh, they're different behaviors. Uh, okay, but that's only part of what renders the vehicle representational according to, to, to Ruth Millikan. There's also the fact that the consumer has some function which will normally be to produce some distal result and, and so let's just do the simple case with the with the frog and the, uh, the vehicles that prompt the tongue snapping system and uh, different things in the frog's optic tectum. Tongue shoots out in different directions. Okay, that's that's all nice and causal, but that's not representational yet. To, now you add in. The point of the tongue stacking system is to catch flies and uh, it'll only succeed. The behavior prompted by the vehicle will only succeed in catching flies if there's a fly in the direction the tongue is going to snap out in. So in virtue of that, the vehicle is now imbued with the content uh, uh, fly in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so I say, look, first of all, we start with the internal stuff, right? So inside the frog's head, there's a system that produces the vehicle and then the vehicle starts the tongue shooting out in a certain direction. And that's all nice and tight and causal. And now we bring in this, this wider framework where we say out there are possible flies and uh, that's what the system is designed for. And because of that, we want to think of the vehicle not just as having the job of uh, 
pushing out the tongue in certain directions, but what's more, as representing it as a fly in a certain direction. And now I put to you what extra causal power, what extra causal illumination do we get out of adding on the extra bit about the vehicle having a content? The vehicle having a content doesn't make any difference to what behaviors it pushes out. It would push out just the same behaviors. We could understand that without bringing any content. And I say, well, so what, what, what extra causal illumination do we get from the content? And my thought is, well, actually none. All we get is, as it were, a pointer to the extra causal facts that we'll obtain when there is a fly in that direction. Because if there is a fly in that direction, either representation isn't just representing, but representing truly, then not only will we get the tongue shooting out, but we'll get a fly being caught. But that's, that's an effect we get only in the case where the representation is true. We don't get any extra effects just by adding on the representation per se. So that's, that's, that's the, the underlying thought here. Adding on representational structure to the vehicles doesn't give you any extra effects. The extra effects only come from the case where the representation is true. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, uh, Lucas has a follow-up question. Let me just find you, Lucas. Apparently, it's uh, so it's not Lucas Torpy. It's other Lucas. Uh, but it's not alphabetical. This thing. He disappeared, no? No, he's, well, I've got him bottom line page two, but. Can you? Ah, okay, good. Yeah, you can unmute yourself now. Perfect, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, David, for, for the amazing talk. And I must say that I am totally on board on the cognitive science view of representation, and I find bustling both the naive realist view and the, and the representational view that you picture here. Yeah. But follow, follow on what you just said, um, I have problems understanding why, why a representation would only have effects when it's true, when, when the content is true, I mean, when the, when the truth condition obtains. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're, when you say that you're referring to the cognitive science view of representation, the one you defend, or you're referring to the, let's say, Burge and Thai uh, representationalism. I mean, my problem is also that um, the, you, you, the, the problem might be that then all sorts of hallucinations and illusions are not representation now at all. Um, because by definition, they're not tracking uh, something in the world out there. But that doesn't mean that they don't have causal effects um, because you can, you can have the behavior of trying to kick the ball regardless of there being a ball or not. And, and that, that whole is a, is a causal chain. So I just want to, to a bit more clarification. And that's, that's helpful. And... I kind of feel that I'm clear about what I want to say, but I'm all too aware that the, the words we have to say it with don't make it clear. And one, one, one word here is representation. What does representation mean? And I mean, this problem goes back to Fodor and mental representation, the representational theory of mind. Fodor, when he first started thinking about representations, was thinking them as sentences in the language of thought, things inside the head, 
Uh, and what he was really interested in was the way that they would interact causally with other such representations inside the head to produce narrow behavior, just movements of our peripheries. And uh, yeah, perfectly interesting program, but, but many philosophers around 1980 all started saying, hang on, well, that's all very well, but, but why are you entitled to call those representations? Uh, where did the representation bit come from? All you're talking about is cogs in a system of pushes and pulls inside their head. Uh, uh, and you're just helping yourself to the idea that they have representational contents. And what's more, the fact that they have representational contents doesn't seem to be making any difference to uh, the story you're telling about what's going on inside the head. So, I mean, in response to your question, there's certainly a sense in which when we have a hallucination, we have a representation. We have a photo star representation, a state inside the head. And that thing has lots of causes and effects. In particular, it will have the effect of your saying, it seemed to me like there was a red, yellow ball in front of me. But it's not in virtue of its being a representation that it has the effect. That's, that's the thought I have. Uh, it's just in virtue of its being a physical state inside the head that it has those effects. Now, as it happens, it is a representation. It is a state that we can usefully view as uh, uh, standing for something outside the head. But when we so view it, and this is what I said in response to Ryan, we don't immediately uh, view it as something or attribute to it uh, uh, a feature that gives it extra causal powers than the ones we mentioned before. It's just the same state with the same causal powers. And now we're viewing it as bearing an interesting relation to certain things outside the head. And that so far doesn't give it any different causal powers. In fact, I want to say because of the nature of representation, it's not the kind of thing that could give it any causal powers at all. I mean, it's not the kind of property, the instantiation of which enters into causal relations. And what it does is it points you to a possible extra set of causal relations, an extra set of causal relations that will obtain in a wide range of cases, either range of cases that obtain when the representation is true, because then there is a yellow ball there and then you'll get the ball moving and so on. Uh, So thinking about representational is in a way of saying, okay, we're going to get the behavioral effect and then something else might happen if the external world is in a certain way. Then we'll not just get the effect, but we'll get the distal result as well. I mean, we'll not just get the behavior, but the distal result as well. Uh, so viewing a, a, an internal state, a representation, as a representation is pointing you to the possibility of some more causal relations, but isn't itself the kind of thing that, that uh, enters into causal relations. Was that, was that helpful? I hope so, I hope so. Uh, okay, Ryan has a follow-up on the follow-up. Can you come back? Yeah, so I thought I maybe have an answer for you. Um, okay. Couldn't so I thought maybe one of the ways someone could respond, a consumer system person who also likes representationalism could respond, is the purpose of positing representational content is it lets us individuate or abstract away from the physical properties of the vehicles and to class them together in terms of their behavioral upshots, even though the vehicles might differ uh, from a totally physical point of view or from extraneous causal upshots. So we say uh, the, these are all representations of balls. Why? Because other things being equal, all of these vehicles, which differ from a purely physical point of view, all cause the right sort of behavior when integrated into a, a larger representational scene. So there's a role for representational content to play. 
And the role that the representational content plays is one of providing the right kind of taxonomy for the vehicles. But okay. it isn't as if those representational properties as such play the uh, causal roles. It's still the properties of the vehicles being consumed by the consumer system. Okay. But it still gives a role for these properties to play, sorry. Yes, I've, look, I've got a whole lot of things to say here and it's, I fear it's going to be a bit messy because this is a messy area. Hmm. Sometimes when people talk about representation, mental representations, states with the semantics, what they're talking about is, is a structure of internal causal roles. So you have conceptual role semantics, inferential role semantics. And I mean, this all goes back to untangling Fodor's talk about representations. And look, when Ned Block wants to say some sensory states are representational and some aren't, what he's actually saying is that some of them are functionalizable and some aren't. That there's certain aspects of what's going on inside the head that you feel would be just the same and feel consciously just the same as long as you had the same structure. And there's some other ones that, that can't be viewed as in terms of uh, structure abstracted from the physical realization. From my perspective, no, that's that's a very interesting debate, and I don't want to. I mean, I'm kind of on Ned's side there, and I don't think that's real representation. I think that's just uh, uh, internal causal role. Now, I don't know. Uh, I don't want this to be a fight about 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 words. So, I think there's something important about saying that's not real representation. Anyway, look, uh, in my book, I say I, I don't want to argue against against uh, somebody who says they're representationist and they just mean that, that, that their internal causal roles that can be usefully captured uh, by abstracting away from the physical realizations and maybe that certain kinds of consciousness are going to go with uh, 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 presence of the abstract structure within the physical realizations. I'm I'm happy to agree about all that. I'm fighting a different different battle. That that semantic relations between in, things inside the head and things outside the head. That's not the kind of thing that can constitute conscious sensory experience. Uh, so I mean, the thought that was was pushing your last remark. Ryan, I, I, I don't especially want to want to resist, but it seems to me it's an importantly different different issue. All right, uh, Ben Van Buren asked the question in chat, possibly name question. Isn't this sort of like saying chemistry doesn't exist because it can be reduced to uh, pushes and pulls at the level of physics? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. And uh, let, let me just get my uh, the issue in focus. Uh, I'm not against the things that can be reduced to pushes and pulls. I think they exist just fine. So I think that they're vehicles of representation. I'm a physicalist, so I think of them as, as uh, neural 
arrangements, but as I said, it would be a dualist and think of them as some kind of intrinsic mind stuff. And they are systems of pushes and pulls inside the head and I'm all in favor of those. Uh, maybe that can be reduced to physics, maybe, maybe not. I mean, in response to Ryan, I was, I was saying I'm sympathetic to people who think that they uh, are constituted a level of structure which is more abstract than, than uh, physical implementation. What I'm concerned with, again, I, is, is representation, which I want to say is not a matter of pushes and pulls at all. Uh, I mean, not, I don't think representation exists, but uh, uh, I think it's a kind of abstract kind of thing and isn't a system of pushes and pulls. And because of that, it's not the right kind of thing to constitute conscious feelings. Uh, so I can't see, I can't see Bert, but I mean, does that, does that answer the issue? He says, yes, very helpful clarification. Okay. Uh, anybody else? So we still have time. How are we doing? Uh, Maureen Ellis asks again, wouldn't the rising incidence of mental illness, crime, Alzheimer's, etc., indicate that we should take hallucinations and representations seriously? Two question marks. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not against uh, taking representations seriously. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm very much in if you ask me on the side of those who do take them seriously, at least against naive, naive realists. Uh, uh, I, I, I think part of the problem with naive realism, it doesn't realize the, the, the strength of the similarities between uh, uh, true representers and false representers. Uh, they're very similar in very striking ways. In particular, they're similar in the way that they're going to behave the same way. So it's not that the, you know, the bad cases we should just put to one side, we don't really understand what's going on. Truth is we understand very well what's going on in the bad cases. They are gonna behave in just the same way as people in the good cases, except uh, since their representations are false, they're not going to uh, get successful successful results. So, uh, yeah, I'm 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 not against uh, 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 hallucinations and representations at all. I'm very much in in favour of them. Uh, yeah. So on 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 on, on my view, uh, exactly. They they lead to lots of of behaviour. Uh, in ways that we can understand, but um, behavior which we can also anticipate is not going to be successful. All right. And apparently, I uh, apparently I overlooked another question from Maureen uh, from earlier. She says, "So this is not the follow up. This 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 question came much earlier, apparently." Uh, thank you very much, David, for a very spiritual account of experience in quotation marks with the limbic system well ahead of the cognitive. Are we in fact gradually arriving at wis wisdom, for example, realizing that causality uh, in brackets, uh, karma in Sanskrit, uh, Vedic language is a long-term matter. Some might say individual perception is a matter of persona inserting chronos in kairos question mark in semiotic terms are we coming to acknowledge we in captions are metaphors metaphysical as much as or even more than physical beings you have demonstrated for us that the individual imagination creates the vehicle to reach the target so i don't know what's the 
I'm not sure. I, I think you're you're attributing more powers to representation than I'm inclined to. I I I'm very much motivated by by wanting to break down representation into its simple components and see what's really going on. And in a way, my my whole approach in the philosophy of perception is is driven by that. I mean, on reflection after finishing my book, I think I just all I've been doing is is drawing out the implications of, of an understanding of representation that I and others have long had for for understanding the nature of perception and and showing how it's not consistent with the kind of views that representationists in the philosophy of perception endorse. All right. Uh, ben uh, Van Buren had a follow up. He says, I suppose this argument also applies to the special science of economics, which is also which is also seems to involve non causal truth relations. This will apply to any science that trades in representation, which uh, will include uh, pretty much all the all the human sciences and much of much of biological science. Yes, yes, and uh, I do think that 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 the notion of representation is something that that plays a a big role in in much of our understanding of the world, but is itself not, not very well uh, understood. And uh, yeah, uh, All right. so, so the argument should, should apply pretty, pretty generally, but whether there are people outside the philosophy of perception who get in this specific tangle that I've been trying to uh, 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 unravel, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'd be interested in special cases. Lucas, what has Lucas got to ask? Hi, I thought I'd pile in. Thanks, thanks for the talk, David. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, on your view, how how do you get the sort of intuition about the sort of intentionality of consciousness and the fact that it's about something? And I think I think you get that in the direct realist. You get that especially amongst the uh, and the representative representationalists, especially the people into phenomenal intentionality. And it seems to me that if if consciousness just depends on the the vehicles, you could have the same sort of vehicle that didn't have any content. So you kind of have the swamp man case, but you could have a more limited version of that. You could have a bit of brain stuff that in some people it was a matter of learning or evolution, but you have it that had the wrong type of causal history. And so it's non-representational. And you so it seems like you're cutting off consciousness from any type of intentionality and it, are you happy with that so how how at least there's the okay. feel that my, my, yeah look consciousness clearly has i mean our conscious center experience clearly has a very rich and detailed structure and what's more uh i take it that we can find out a lot about that rich and detailed structure just uh, pretty easily from introspection. I mean, I think we have to be very careful with introspection, but it's not like it's completely uninformative about, I mean, it's misleading. I mean, there's clearly a lot of detail. When I look at the cherry tree, there's all these kind of, uh, 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 yeah, a lot of detail. Uh, okay, uh, two things to say about that in response. One is that, When you, the nature of this detail is such that it makes it very natural, inviting, seductive to suppose that sensory experience is intrinsically representational. So I, I, I don't think, I mean, for a start, it makes it very natural and seductive to suppose that worldly properties are literally present in your experiences, even in the bad cases. Uh, that yellowness and squareness and so on. Uh, and once you've accepted that, then it's a very small step to concluding that the experiences are intrinsically representational. It's, you know, the obvious step is that uh, they representing those self same properties to be instantiated in front of you. So now, of course, on my view, I think that's all a mistake, but I do certainly want to grant that, that 
sensory experience does have this rich structure that in that sense seems intrinsically intentional in the sense it's, it's very seductive to suppose that. There's some people in this area who, when they talk about the intentionality experience, just want to be referring to that rich structure and stand back from the question of whether that rich structure is really representing something beyond us. And with those people, I have no special argument. So, so uh, in that sense, uh, the experience has a structure that makes it natural to suppose it represents the world. Yeah, experience is intentional in that sense. But the, I mean, the conclusion we are seduced into, into embracing is a mistake and it doesn't really represent intrinsically. So that's one thing to say. Another thing to say is, of course, the structure of our experience is such that it's very well suited to representing what it really does. I mean, uh, shape experience is very well suited to representing shapes. They have a structure in relation to other shape experiences, their relation to behavior makes them very well suited by, and it's not an accident that they're so well suited, that's a matter of evolution. But again, that's not, I mean, the, uh, the number series, sorry, the numeral series, the series of numerals very well suited to representing the cardinal numbers. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that uh, the number, the, the numeral one in English intrinsically represents the cardinal numbers. So, uh, so it's two things to say. I mean, uh, experience has a very well rich structure, which one makes it natural to suppose it's intrinsically intentional, and two uh, uh, makes it very well suited for representing what it does. I don't want to deny either of those two things. All right. And with that, I think we should stop because we are out of time. And I suppose David is already exhausted by this um, grilling. <laughs> uh, let's all thank David. Thank you all very much for staying. It's very nice to see those of you who uh, I'm seeing again. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Right. Thank you all for the for the for your questions and discussions and comments. We'll see you next time, eleventh uh, uh, of May, I think, when our guest speaker is Majvita Chirimuta of the University of Edinburgh. So, with that, I bid you goodbye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Ciao, ciao.